thank you for your patience. Uh, digital connectivity is a key part of the government's self-proclaimed infrastructure revolution. Not only did it form a key part of the Prime Minister's speech on the steps of Downing Street, just today the Chancellor has announced in excess of £5 billion will be made available for connectivity upgrades across the UK. So the question we're asking today is, how can the UK fulfil its ambitions when it comes to digital connectivity? My name is Benjamin Barnard, and I am Head of Technology Policy here at Policy Exchange. If there are four people who know whether the government can meet its very ambitious targets, it's the four people that we have on our panel today. Nikki Morgan has been Secretary of State for, the, for Digital, Culture, Media and Sports since July 2019. She's previously served as Secretary of State for Women and Equalities, as well as Secretary of State for Education, um, and before that, as Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Catherine Collins is the Managing Director for Corporate Affairs at OpenReach, the UK's largest digital infrastructure company. OpenReach employs 32,000 uh, people and supports more than 620 communications providers to connect in excess of 30 million people across the country. Paddy McGuinness is a senior advisor to Brunswick Group. Prior to joining Brunswick, Paddy was most recently the Deputy National Security Advisor for Intelligence, Security and Resilience, where he advised the Prime Minister and National Security Council on policy and decision making on homeland security issues, including national resilience, cyber response, cyber security, counter-terrorism and the UK's response to actions by hostile states. And Lord Maud of Horsham, a former Shadow Chancellor and Shadow Foreign Secretary, um, was Paymaster General and Minister for the Cabinet Office from 2010 to April 2015. It is estimated that he made over £50 billion worth of efficiency savings in that post. And indeed, to quote the All-Party Science and Technology Committee report into digital government just earlier this year, political leadership in digitisation has been lacking in the years since Francis Maud ceased being Minister for the Cabinet Office. If there is anybody who knows what is achievable in government, it's Lord Maud of Horsham. Without further ado, Nikki Morgan, what are <laughs> the government's ambitions and how are you going to meet them? Well, thank you very much indeed. My apologies for um, keeping you uh, waiting. Um, we were slightly overrunning in the, the main uh, hall. Um, the government's ambitions are very clear. We want to accelerate uh, the uh, rollout of gigabit-enabled connectivity uh, and we're aiming for 2025 to make sure that extends to uh, all uh, premises across the United Kingdom. Now, that is a hugely ambitious task. Uh, but it is one that I think that we will be able to achieve. Why do I do that? I think that because we'll be able to tackle it on a number of different uh, bases. We as government know that our role is obviously not to build the infrastructure, but it is to facilitate the building of that infrastructure. It is to make sure that there is the appropriate regulatory uh, framework, that we are tackling any barriers, uh, of which there are many, and I suspect we're going to hear from some of the panellists about that, tackling things like around the planning uh, system, uh, uh, things like uh, getting uh, the, uh, the infrastructure into, uh, not just into uh, buildings with multiple occupiers, uh, multiple oc occupants, but also to make sure that, that uh, they are, uh, the, the premises are connected from there. Uh, tackling, obviously, uh, new house building, for example, to make sure that all of that uh, is enabled for uh, 21st century uh, connectivity. Uh, helping, I think, working with many of the providers um, <coughs> in terms of making sure they've got the right labour and sufficient numbers of people. Uh, and so um, already um, the, um, the, the former DWP secretary, for example, was working with OpenReach to make sure that people um, who were unemployed uh, were trained and offered opportunities uh, to work with our broadband and telecoms uh, providers, for example. And there'll be ma many other examples uh, of that. Um, and I was on a, a platform this morning uh, with Clive Selly, who was saying that, of course, it's not a question of getting 20 to 5 and then that's it, job done, because then there will be more connectivity uh, to happen uh, um, and, of course, there will always be the, the maintenance. And the thing I think we're learning is that, of course, this technology is not going to stand still. Um, just because we get to one uh, speed and one outcome, actually, then there will be further uh, demand. We also need to think about how we're going to stimulate customer uh, demand as well uh, to make sure that, actually, there is the uptake for this enhanced uh, connectivity. Uh, so the point is, is to tackle it uh, at many different levels. It's to have a partnership between public and private where there are barriers in the way, and I think France has very much demonstrated this when he was in government, you know, not accepting <coughs> those barriers, but challenging them, uh, actually challenging uh, officials in Whitehall, uh, those who are working in companies to say, we can do this and we need to do this. Because actually the other part of my portfolio, both in terms of obviously digital and tech, attracting startups and companies to be here and to grow, 
but also in terms of art and culture and sport. You know, we look after, for example, relationships with the broadcasters, both public service, uh, but also some of our, our new uh, streaming services, uh, for example. And actually, we know that better connectivity is going to be essential to make sure, that, make sure that they want to be based here, to roll out their businesses, and to grow here uh, as well. So this is absolutely essential. It's not a nice to have uh, for the 21st century. It is essential for the UK to remain one of the most successful economies in the world. And we absolutely look forward to playing our part, working, as I say, uh, with providers, with others, uh, working with customers as well to understand the offer services that are out there uh, and to tackle things like digital inclusion uh, as well to make sure that actually everybody feels that the digital nation is very much for them. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Columns, um, IPSA UK, the FCS, the Independence Network Cooperative Association, recently wrote a letter to Boris Johnson outlining four key policy areas that the whole industry agreed needed urgent attention to enable them to meet the government's ambitions. These were the fibre tax, way leave agreements, new builds and skills. I was wondering whether you could outline these difficulties for us, but even more so explain how Openreach are going to be rising to the challenge of meeting the government's targets. Very happy to. Um, so firstly, I mean, I just want to say it is absolutely fantastic to see digital connectivity at the heart of this government's infrastructure strategy. I think it's something that all of us who are fibre builders in the room, and I sort of see others who are uh, sort of undertaking that challenge as well, you know, we think it's really, really critical that this is considered critical national infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic to see the announcements that have been made today by the Chancellor, and also to have that very, very ambitious target of gigabit and full fibre connectivity um, relatively soon, which is <laughs> a huge ambition, but we are up for that challenge. Um, and I think, you know, w when you think about the sort of things we've been talking um, to government about and we need help with, it is fundamentally about how you get that big build started. So Openreach fundamentally believes that it's a full fibre future out there. Um, we see how critical it is to people's daily lives. We have 25,000 people and engineers out there on the streets day in, day out, who are there either connecting customers or fixing their service. We see how critical it is to everyday life, be it people trying to do homework at school with their kids, uh, if you're trying to work from home, if you're trying to run a small business. We know this is now you know, pretty much considered a fundamental human right for people, and we're committed to trying to ensure that we can get full fibre out there as far and as fast as possible. What we've done at Openreach is uh, sort of rebuild the machine, if you like. So we have um, extended experience of trying to build um, the superfast network, uh, which now gets to about 96, 97% of the UK. Uh, but we're flipping that machine to basically build full fibre. Uh, we doubled our rate of build last year. Um, we're now at nearly 1.8 million uh, full fibre premises. Um, and the short-term plan is to get to 4 million premises by the end of our financial year 2021. And the ambition is to get to nearer 15 million uh, by the mid-2020s. Now, to do that is a huge sort of civil engineering challenge in the way the uh, Chancellor <coughs> talked about this afternoon. He sort of talked about this being uh, the sort of biggest uh, project since the Victorian age. And I, I think that's very true. You know, if you put full fibre in the ground, it should last the test of time. It should last the next 100 years in the same way that copper has actually done us quite well for the last 100 years. But we are looking at a technology that will last for future generations. But it's a big civil engineering challenge. So we're talking about trying to connect over 30 million individual premises with a new technology. Uh, so that means fundamentally trying to make those individual connections. Therefore, it is about the pace and the scale of build, which is why some of the stuff we've talked about is very much about enabling that machine. So the kind of four things you raise, um, the first thing in terms of pace of deployment is as you are building, we fundamentally have to get access to be able to build. So this is an issue around way leaves. Uh, which I never expected to be an expert on, and after the last <laughs> three years in open reach, I'm now the world's expert on way leaves. Um, but way leaves are really, really fundamental. So in our build, we currently can't access 44% of the flats or the multi-dwelling units that we build to. In the city of London, that's even higher. That's nearly 75, 80%. And if you think about the kind of efficiency of build, but also just fundamentally leaving people behind as you build, that just cannot work. Uh, so we fundamentally have to address this issue of way leaves, both into property but also across land. Because the other thing that we're really delighted to see is the money that the Chancellor talked about for rural build. Openreach is uh, not just a city fibre builder. You know, we very much build in rural areas and it's critical we address that outside-in problem as we go. But to do that, we need to access 
land and cross other people's land. So the whole way leaves issue is critical. Uh, you mentioned new build. Uh, we're obviously building as a country hundreds of thousands of new build homes um, every year. There is no legislation at the moment that mandates that you must put full fibre into new builds. So I know Nikki feels very strongly about this yeah. one. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just crazy. If, if we're building homes today, we need to put the best future-proof technology in. Mm. Uh, Labour's a really interesting one. Uh, we're obviously going to need a lot of people to try and build this network, especially if we're trying to build the majority of it by a sort of 2025 timeline. Um, that that labour will come in a mix of forms. So OpenReach is trying to hire as many people as possible. We've hired 6,000 people in the last two years um, who all get kind of put through our apprenticeships and training schools. So actually there's a skills issue as well as a labour issue. So it's really important we skill our people mm -hmm. so that they have that engineering capability to build the network and, as Nikki says, maintain the network. But we're also going to need access to labour who predominantly work in a sort of subcontractor field, and a lot of those come from outside the UK. Uh, so historically, the networks um, that have been built um, across Europe um, in full fibre, those people come and tend to work for us here um, in the subcontractor base. So we ideally need some kind of mechanism whereby, while we've got this big national project, we can access that labour and have those people coming in and working seasonally so we can mm -hmm. build a network. Mm -hmm. The last point you raised is about um, the fibre tax. Uh, this is something that, uh, again, I never expected to be an expert in, um, which is around business rates. Um, so we are actually taxed on the fibre infrastructure that we build, and we're taxed on it before we make any return from it, or, or we basically get a business case or anyone actually using the network. Um, so in the spirit of trying to incentivise investment and a lot of the investment is going to come from us you know we're hugely grateful for the funds that are being committed by government but the industry is up for this there is money out there if there is the right investment case and the right business case and so trying to create the right environment for investors is critical so we would ask that there's an exemption on the business rates that's applied um, on full fiber for the period of us building um, and that we hope will reinvigorate and help us as a sector and the builders in this room achieve those very ambitious targets that the government has set us. Very good. Um, Paddy, the big dark elephant in the room is security. Um, and I was wondering whether I might ask you how resilient the UK's networks are at the moment, and how might ensuring the continued resilience of our network impact upon the government's um, ambitions in the future? Well, thank you for framing it that way, and, mm. and it's really helpful. It's worth reflecting that uh, we've got a, uh, a developed way of thinking about strategy. So there was a coalition government uh, strategy in 2010. I think, Francis, you were part of pulling it together, um, uh, which concluded that national resilience was one of the priorities for national security. A a and then that was pulled through in 2015, uh, 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 a conservative, purely conservative uh, strategy, uh, where um, national resilience began to focus in cybersecurity on particular areas and communications alongside energy and finance and defense were there at the top. So, so we know that telecommunications in all its elements is a priority for national resilience, and we know that because we know it's targeted. And occasionally we hear about it being targeted, so we hear about uh, the FBI and the National Cybersecurity Center from the UK talking about half a million telephony routers being compromised uh, by an actor known as APT28, who seems to be Russian. So we know that people are messing with them. We also know from our own offensive cyber program, which is talked about but not very much, that if you're going to mess with an opponent, you're going to mess with their communications. So mm. evidently, the telephony network is in the front line. Um, and uh, fibre broadband is a component of it and therefore will be a target. It isn't, once you've stuck it underground, I mean, one of the features of it, it isn't the most intelligent bit of the network or the bit most easily targeted. So let's not go over the top about <coughs> how vulnerable fibre is, but it is a factor, so it needs to be looked after. And it's important that resilience of the network, whether that be from threat, hostile states, or hazard, other interferences that come from you know, natural events uh, are, are, are built into planning. In hybrid warfare, an opponent likes to push you when you're off balance. You're off balance if you have a flood, a power outage, you know, a major political event, 
and then they like to push you. So it isn't just a matter of a state coming at you, first of all. Second thought, the United Kingdom has comparable advantage, or comparative advantage, in security. And that's been true in our communication security, amongst other things. And that's partly because of just our history of being in the front line uh, in so many of the, you know, the battles of history. It, it, it's also a function of the fact that we have signals intelligence excellence in GCHQ. Uh, we've had strategies that have been pulled through for our cyber security. And, worth noting, and with open reach here with us on the platform, we have a history of partnership between the public and private sector in the national security space. And there's a set of mm -hmm. companies who operate very much under, mm -hmm. uh, under Secretary of State's direction um, who uh, contribute massively to our collective security, whether that be um, putting in place uh, equipment which is secure by design or whether that be working with us on cybersecurity or uh, whether that be you know, helping us uh, run uh, national security operations, intercept communications, all those other good things. And it's just worth always having that in mind when we think about our industrial strategy because we need that partnership and no disrespect to them, big American tech doesn't and no disrespect to them, nor does big China tech. So there is something quite precious about the national security mm -hmm. factors in the relationship with the backbone providers. Final thought. Uh, so my feeling is, is that resilience has to be at the centre of the 2025 uh, objective. Of course, we mustn't let it be a drag factor, so we've really got to work at it. We've got to work at reducing the other drag factors that might be there, so eliminate those. And we need to learn the lessons of things like, and no disrespect to Australia, the national broadband network in Australia, where resilience and security was not sufficiently <coughs> central, and therefore some of the decisions about the way that it was rolled out uh, actually... Um, prevent its use for maximum resilience and national security effect. So I think we're talking about something secure by default. Absolutely final thought. Security in the future is going to be security at machine speed. You know, our cyber security is going to be done by machines mm -hmm. through fast networks. So this isn't only about our security today, it's about our security in the future too. Is the government, are the government's targets just hot air before an election campaign? I mean, are they actually going to be able to do this <laughs> in government? Of course. <laughs> I mean, you, doing anything difficult starts with saying what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it's an admirable um, objective to set, and a, it's a great thing to, to, to do. I mean, uh, since I left government three and a half years ago, um, uh, my services um, uh, in uh, helping to save money and the British government were no longer needed. So uh, we set up a, a venture to work with other governments on how to do this, mm -hmm. having learned a lot of, very painfully mm -hmm. of how to make difficult things happen in government. And after, the first thing we always say to governments is uh, working out what to do, that's the easy bit. Yeah. That's 10% of the challenge. 90% is working out how the hell are you going to make it happen. Uh, and. Um, and this is a really important uh, thing to make happen mm. and an extraordinarily difficult thing to make happen. Why is it important? You know, it, it, the impact of high-speed um, working has on productivity is huge. When I started in the Cabinet Office nearly 10 years ago, I couldn't, literally couldn't use the technology in the Cabinet Office, actually because the security was so overpowering yeah. um, that it was completely the enemy of, of uh, efficiency and productivity. Um, and, you know, and, and if we want to be somewhere uh, where the Internet of Things is, uh, is w we create a kind of sandbox of, uh, for the Internet of Things to be developed at high speed, we need to have the connectivity infrastructure to make it, to make it possible. We showed with what we did with our big open data program um, in the first part of the, this decade how creating a raw material the huge amounts of government data that we made available for public use was a magnet for uh, developers, for entrepreneurs, for investment in, in the use of data uh, as, a, as a raw material. So creating this infrastructure mm. is absolutely <coughs> essential yeah. for, for broader uh, economic development. And you know, how do we know this is a difficult thing to make happen? Well, look, in the part of Sussex I live in, we haven't even got 3G, uh, let alone 4G. So 5G is a, it feels like a a very distant dream. 
Um, how, do, how do you make something like this happen? Um, well, there are um, essentially four reasons why big change programs fail uh, in government. There's political pushback, and you can see the political pushback there is with what I think is a fantastically important program, HS2. Uh, there is the resistance, active resistance by vested interests, and with, you know, and, and there are that that will come into play here because there are the existing uh, uh, channels who will not welcome the competition that 5G uh, brings. There's simply inertia system inertia, bureaucratic inertia, which is just there. And the final thing, which people very rarely notice, the sheer lack of technical capability, of real sharp, high-end, world-class technical <coughs> capability within government. And that's particularly uh, challenging here, where um, you're doing it, you're trying to, you've got a government objective and a government program, but we don't actually, in government, hold the levers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's even worse than HS2 because HS2, the company, HS2, is at least a government-owned company that ought to be able to make things happen at speed and effectively. And here you're working at at least one remove, if not, if <coughs> not two. And the only, but when you think about it, when you think about when the big national programs uh, have been successful, often it's been in wartime. Uh, where you have exactly the same kind of problems. You know, the government, by and large, didn't own the munitions factories, uh, but it had to drive. You had that, that leadership and drive from the center of government, which galvanized the activity in other parts of the economy in a very coordinated way to make it happen. And if you want to make this happen, then uh, I'm afraid, Nikki, there's no substitute for being on the case yep, every absolutely. single day. Yep. Uh, and... <laughs> as soon as a problem arises, like some obscure problem with way leaves and access that you were, uh, you were just uh, saying, um, there's a solution to some of it in Scottish law, but not in English and Welsh law. Well, that's something that actually governments can deal with and parliament can deal with. It's politically probably not very controversial. So you need to know about these things very quickly, deal with them very quickly, be on the case very quickly, not assume anything, never assume that things are happening because quite often they simply don't. This is the inertia factor. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there is no substitute for that. And it's, it's old fashioned, I'm afraid. Being on the case all the time, eternal vigilance. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, if you could start by stating your name and organization, and if you could also try and keep them as short as possible. Um, I'm going to be very vigilant if people go off on sort of long rants, and I will just cut you off. <laughs> um, so if we could start, please, uh, with uh, the gentleman there um, um, in, the, in the cream shirt. Um, that's, yeah. <laughs> so here's quite. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, James Kemmel, work with a company called Inmarsat. Mm. And in fact, we're doing an event in here tomorrow morning, so please um, do come. The point about not having the levers, I think, is, is very well taken. Um, 5G is a particular problem there because a lot of the activities are taking place in industry-led standardization groups where there's no real government participation because it's the industry coming. How might you intervene in that? And the second area where that also applies is to do with the independent regulator, Ofcom, mm. who has a very powerful role in spectrum allocation, radio spectrum allocation, mm. um, but acts, as it properly should do, in an independent way, which can be to the detriment of bodies like the space and satellite industry who require a lot of international coordination. Um, how do you deal with those particular instances of, of not really having the levers? Nikki, do you want to, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think well, you have to work with people um, and you have to find other ways. Um, you know, I can't really go into all of the, the relationships, but, but usually there are things that the people you're working with want or need from government. Um, and we will want to need progress from them. I think France's the point about, um, uh, you know, needing, even though it holds all the levers, um, you know, actually having strong project management from the government or a joint, you know, management board um, and direct ministerial involvement um, because um, however big the chief executives are and how big the companies are, actually they don't want to spend time sitting in a government department explaining why a target has been missed. And so actually if they um, hopefully know um, and it becomes a, it's, it's a real partnership, um, uh, that actually um, 
they haven't got to sit there and explain things to the minister. They've just got to hopefully report back on progress that has been that has been made. So I suppose it's a question perhaps sometimes of finding, be more inventive in finding some of the levers than some of the obvious ones. Fantastic. Um, further questions? Okay, there are quite a lot, so we might take them in threes, if that's okay. Could we start with the gentleman back there? Um, and then we'll come down here and we'll finish at the front. Hi, my name is Rupert. I'm from the Cheltenham Association. And um, so my question is a bit about today's uh, five billion pound mm. announcement. Um, there was a, a subtle shift in the language of the, of the announcement. Prior commitments, you uh, talked specifically about full fiber, whereas this talked about gigabit yeah. uh, commitment. While 5G is theoretically capable of that, real world results will fall, will, will fall short of, of that uh, speed. Um, is this a watering down of the full fiber commitments that were prior, prior, previously made? Yep, this gentleman there. Uh, Mark Winnington, I'm the portfolio holder at, uh, Staff at Staffordshire County Council for delivery of superfast broadband, yep. which was the massive speed of 28 uh, megabits plus. Mm -hmm. um, we were really successful working with, with OpenReach on this and, and, and uh, BT at the start. Uh, and that partnership with, with a certain levers from us uh, really worked. And mm -hmm. we delivered 96. When yep. we said we were going to deliver 96, it's worked really well. There's 4% of Staffordshire, I'm one of them, that gets somewhere in the region of 1.3 mm -hmm. megabits. Uh, and it's really a, how are you going to almost ensure that, that while the, the, the lucrative gold pot of, of, of the big built-up areas is covered by open reach, that the, the, the more difficult, cost, costly part of the, the rural network, which hasn't actually got anything at the moment, gets FTP in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. And the gentleman at the front, just to... Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Watson. I'm a uh, councillor for a, a rural area, so obviously connectivity is a big issue for me. Um, but I'm also a solicitor, um, and I specialise in telecoms and property-related work. For many years, there were two aspects to our work. There was entering into new agreements, mm -hmm. and there was removing agreements, uh, uh, removing uh, apparatus from sites, predominantly mobile infrastructure. Um, since 2017, um, we don't do new agreements anymore. I mean, we literally do not do them. Um, but I'm having to hire more and more people to throw operators off land because the property industry is so alienated by the provisions of the code. Um, would it not be better to work with the property sector rather than, because they're quite happy to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds slugging it out in the tribunal, which is not productive. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And we might start um, with Catherine and then come to mm -hmm. sort of Nikki and then move along. Um, <coughs> So I think there's an interesting theme in some of these conversations, which is actually just about the cooperation. So I think that the other thing that I sort of didn't mention in terms of if we're actually going to achieve this and do as much as we can by 2025, be it gigabit or full fibre, the only way we can do this is by working really closely with all the people who are critical to the programme. That includes working very closely with local authorities so that we can try and minimise disruption, but also work out what that build programme looks like. But I agree with you entirely. You know, the, we need to ensure that we can come to the right kind of agreements and arrangements with all the people involved, developers, property developers, as well as you know, potential landlords and landholders to ensure it works. So I agree, a kind of consensual solution in this makes sense because ultimately we don't have a lot of time. So we don't have the time to try and fight it out. We don't want to go into dispute. Um, in terms of the sort of question about the sort of five billion a bit and sort of how, how you get to those final percent. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it, it's really difficult. Uh, so if you think about trying to sort of do full fiber, there is a sweet spot in where you build. That sweet spot is actually not sort of center of cities, but it's suburbia, uh, because that's where you, know, you can probably do some of the road closures. It's less disruptive. You've got better access to infrastructure. What's really difficult is doing somewhere like central Manchester, because then everyone notices if you've shut everything. Um, and what is very hard is doing that ultra rural. So um, we don't have a perfect answer yet. Um, we are actually doing trials, which we're going to announce um, on Friday, which is about trying to use existing technology and innovation to try and unlock how we can go further and actually at a cheaper cost point to try and get to some of these rural locations. So we're committed to trying to find a solution for rural, for full fibre that works and is cost effective. We do have a current scheme at the moment 
which you may know about, which is community fibre partnerships where we co-fund actually <coughs> rural gigabit connectivity vouchers. We're finding that most communities who are coming to us now are not having to pay, if anything, mm -hmm. in terms of connecting to full fibre because the vouchers mm -hmm. are so generous now that they enable most people to connect. So we should have a look at that if not, but we're committed to trying to sort the problem out and need to work with uh, Nikki and government on how that five billion can go as far as it can in those hard to reach areas. Uh, before handing over to Nikki, I should say that we do explore the issues of vouchers in the policy exchange report, Modernising the United Kingdom. It wasn't uh, which, a set up uh, one. <laughs> which, which, which has a, a range of these issues. I thought I'd do a little self-promotional plug there for policy mm. exchange. Uh, Nikki, um, you'll want to address various things. Yeah, no, thank you. Well, I think, I mean, as you say, they all link together. Um, uh, you know, the, the, um, Catherine and the operators may have a, a view particularly on the, the property and the land ownership, but I mean, absolutely right. We know, obviously, we need to, to work together, and if there are uh, barriers, uh, we want to try to eliminate those or problems that people have to concentrate on that stop um, the ambition being, being met. So, um, interesting to hear about, about those. And in a way, that answers the first question. The ambition, it absolutely, is undimmed. Uh, but the point is to focus actually on what the outcome is uh, and so what the speed is going to be that people are going to need and to make sure that we are future-proofed. I'm not sure I agree with you about the 5G, um, that's, uh, you know, um, but there are going to be different ways of getting to, uh, to, to that point. Um, of course, actually, fibre, for getting full fibre pretty well everywhere to enable the 5G connectivity is going to be very much a, a, a part of that. Um, so uh, I think one of the things in an earlier panel that I was on again today, I seem to spend a lot of time talking about these issues uh, today, unsurprisingly perhaps, uh, is actually it is about customer demand. Um, if we say to people, you know, do you want a gigabit? Um, I think many people will say, well, I'm not sure what that is and what I do. If you say, actually, do you want to be able to fa stream faster, um, you know, actually a number of people who stream at the same time, be able to work from home, to make that actually more feasible if you're in a rural area, to make sure that, as I saw with my local farmers recently, they're uploading and downloading crop rotations and plans for their fields and all the rest of it in a much more uh, efficient way, then people get it. And that's when they start demanding, actually, those, um, those services. Uh, and in relation to that, I mean, I think today's announcement is about very much helping, whether it's the 4% the or the 20%. The um, and it is, as Catherine said, it's about we are, we are exploring with the um, providers how do we... It's obvious there are some areas where it makes you know, commercial sense to be and, and government support is very much not needed. But there are obviously other areas where, where that's not the case. Um, what can we do to incentivise, um, and Catherine used the phrase, outside in? What that means is we're not going to leave the last 4%, 20%, 10% .10 until the end, because I think that is deeply unfair. We need those communities to be able to see that at the same time that the easier rollout areas, if I could put it like that, the more commercially attractive rollout areas are happening, that they're also getting the connectivity too. And that's why we have um, you know, made that announcement today. Fantastic. We might take three more questions. If there's somebody who wants to ask about security, I'm quite... <laughs> <laughs> so, sir, the, the gentleman... Yes, um, Oh, resilience, let's phrase it like that. Would the gentleman with the grey jacket, um, and um, we'll go to him, and we'll then come, come down. OK, well, I'm Alok from uh, Watford constituency. Um, really, uh, security is a big issue because if you're going to have a gigabit broadband, we know people will be able to steal our data ten times faster. So that is a big issue, and I'm mainly concerned really with Huawei and the Chinese uh, involvement because they have a habit of um, not, but the government I'm talking about, not the people, have a habit of actually um, not playing fair. Uh, what I'm interested in is to what extent can the nodes and the routers and the routers and everything else can be managed by own British-led uh, technology so that it's not actually in the hands of other people because this is a critical issue of our security. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the gentleman just in front in the white shirt. Thank you. I'm uh, Joe Swarbrick from City Fibre. Um, we've heard a lot today about the huge task of actually rolling this stuff out and getting it in the ground um, and getting the right regulatory regime to make that happen. Yeah. Um, we've also heard, I think, Secretary of State earlier about the, um, on a different panel about... Um, once this stuff is in the ground, the kind of content it's used for and, and regulating that content. And we also, someone touched on earlier about Ofcom's role in Spectrum. Mm. Um, with a new Ofcom CEO incoming, how, with, and with all of those other things to think about, how high up in their in-trade do you think digital infrastructure and the regulation of that is going to be, and how high up would you expect it to be? Mm. Okay. Thank you. If we go to the gentleman in the shirt, um, just uh, the, the striped shirt, just there. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Gooch. I'm a district councillor in Witchhaven, Worcestershire. Uh, um, I also run a, a, an online publishing business which makes a lot of use of material produced under the Open Government Licence, which I think was one of Francis Maud's uh, introductions, so I'm very pleased about that. But a long time ago, well, several years ago, I used to work for an ISP, and we used to reckon then that uh, our biggest problems weren't caused by our own equipment failures or by hackers or anything. They were caused by over-enthusiastic builders with a JCB. So on the, on the subject of... Uh, <laughs> Resilience. This is a, a really crucial thing. We, we already have a universal service obligation, which isn't being met in rural areas, as has already been referred to, but for, for speed. But we also need a, a USO for a service level agreement for reliability and uptime. Is there going to be? Is that in the thinking that it's not enough to have gigabit? Um, fibre if it goes down every other week or whatever. We need, as, we need as reliability as well as speed, and that needs to be built into the system. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. I think, Paddy, there's quite a lot for you to take on. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I'm, I'm going to make people a little bit unhappy, possibly. But um, so, so I think the government and uh, the National Cybersecurity Centre have been very clear that they have expectations of the engineering standards that a company like Huawei should meet and that they haven't been always satisfied with what they've got out of the joint cell they've had with them, and they're working through it. But I'm very concerned that we shouldn't fetishize the question of Huawei. And we shouldn't fetishize it because it, 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 the way in which we're talking about it is delusional. So the reality <coughs> is, is that China is a world-leading country when it comes to telecommunications technology and 5G, and that the majority of 5G research going on at the moment is going on with a Chinese footprint, and that almost every device that you might want to buy that might be relevant to 5G will have Chinese components in it. So the idea that if we simply address the question of Huawei and fall into uh, you know, excluding them or not allowing them in our network, we're going to resolve the question of our interaction with Chinese equipment, with China as a technology partner, I think is mistaken. I also reflect that we've already allowed a whole set of non-British, in fact, almost wholly non-British equipment into our network at 3G and 4G. So if we begin to talk about not having it in our network, saying oh, we really can't have this in our network, we're going to have to start digging stuff up. And so it isn't that we're going to achieve mm -hmm. the 2025 objective. We're going to go backwards rather than forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, all as a result of us thinking about um, uh, these, these questions, either as a matter of geopolitics mm. or as a matter of national security resilience, rather than as a commercial matter to be managed. And I'd observe in other parts of our critical national infrastructure, we allow in foreign technologies, not all Chinese, and we make ourselves satisfied through regulation and monitoring and involvement and control that we can have them in our network. And I think that must be the way forward on these technologies. And I, but, so I'm really concerned that we might make a decision, or we might make a political decision about what we allow to be in our networks based upon a delusional view of the nature of the world and what is possible and what is best for the United Kingdom. And we shouldn't be swayed. We should make a technocratic judgment about what is going to work for us and what we are satisfied we can manage in our network. Place it a very great deal upon Secretaries of State and the uh, and the security apparatus to do that for us, but I think we need to have that, no matter how strongly we feel about the narrative around foreign technology in our networks. Mm. Mm. Well, Maud, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on that, and also the delivery issues that keep coming up time well, and again. I mean, Pat, I think nothing to add, really, to what Paddy said. He's, he's absolutely right. He knows a huge amount about this, uh, this topic. Um, and and the, the idea that you can suddenly say, Huawei, Chinese technology, we don't want any of it in our communication systems, is like saying, I want, to, I want to take the eggs out of this cake that's just been baked. I mean, you can't do it. It's just uh, without, you'd have to build, bake the whole bloody cake again yeah. um, from the beginning. And, and that's not going to uh, take things forward. So um, I think that, it, that is absolutely right. I just want to make a quick point about uh, rural <coughs> and... Um, and Sorry, sort of personal vested interest here. Um, <laughs> and um, I remember when I was uh, in the coalition government, I chaired a digital task force. And one of the things we, we found was we kept finding more and more 
um, under, unused or underused fibre, um, which had been paid for effectively by the taxpayer, mm. um, and, but which no one was really knew about and was not being brought into the calculations. Um, and uh, the network rail have a huge yeah. amount of, of fibre running around the, the country into, by definition, a lot of rural areas. Uh, I think Highways England had a, a huge right. amount too. Um, and, as, I mean, again, I may have remembered this wrong, but I think every wind farm that there is, which, again, by definition, are in quite uh, far-flung, remote rural areas, I think are all connected by fibre um, as, uh, as well. And, so there, and, and, and the demands made on that fibre are very slight. So this is not completely dark, but it's pretty dark. Um, and so, I mean, it, this is part of the kind of having a a very highly coordinated and strongly driven um, kind of uh, operational board which pulls all this together. Mm. Is how do you make all that happen? And you know, if at the end of the day it requires, it's, because consensus building is yep. is great, and, and you know, we all want to have buy-in <coughs> and, and goodwill and take hearts and minds and so on. But it sometimes helps if you've got some mandatory powers mm. as well. Mm. I mean, the old Theodore Roosevelt. Um, doctrine, you know, speak softly, persuade, talk, take people with you, but carry the big <laughs> stick because you know what it gets people's attention, uh, and uh, and and I suspect some of that's going to be necessary here because you know the one thing you cannot afford in a country like this where everyone agrees that making this happen is of crucial importance for our uh, economic future and, uh, frankly, our social uh, future as well. You cannot afford for the assets that are already there not to be fully used. Mm. Thank you. I think we might get um, some response on that and also the points that Paddy's raised from the Secretary of State. Um, well, actually, I'm not going to respond to the points Paddy raised because he has set them out, obviously, extremely well. Um, and uh, much as I love policy exchange, this is such an important, critical national security issue that we're going to exercise uh, the debate around that in the National Security Council <laughs> rather than yeah. here at party conference, which I think is the right thing. Me, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which I think is the right thing to do for the future of the country. But I hear what the gentleman says. It's, it's a view that I have heard before. Um, we've also had a, a counter view, um, and it is a difficult issue uh, involving uh, many different strands of government policy, not just about the resilience or otherwise of our telecoms uh, infrastructure. So um, thank you for making the, uh, the, the point. Um, in relation to the um, Ofcom uh, CEO role, I mean, I think, I think this, this, is imp this is important, uh, and it's, um, it's up there. You're right, they're going to have whoever's going to take over has got some very big shoes to fill after Sharon White, and they've also got a very, very busy in-tray. Um, and um, there are a number of things that they're doing now, Ofcom, but that you're right, um, we potentially might ask e them to do extra in other areas as well. Um, and um, we need, obviously, and they want to make sure that that is done, done well. Um, you know, they're an organisation that I've been very impressed with, having met them and worked with them over the last couple of, of months. Um, but um, this, I think this has to be, because I think so much else flows, as we've already heard in this panel, from having great connectivity for other services and other investment um, and other areas of growth for our uh, economy. And in terms of the universal service obligation, I mean, you're right, it's not just about digging through uh, cables <coughs> and pipes. Um, you know, human error is often to account for uh, an awful lot of the problems that we encounter with our, um, our technology. Um, it all goes back to somebody... Um, I, I worked, I'm a, I'm a solicitor by, by, by training, um, and um, we were always taught in my old law firm, you know, you mustn't sort of bring in uh, all sorts of uh, dangers to the, the, the network, it'll knock it out and take client files and, and all the rest of it. Um, and then it was the IT department that allowed somebody unclear to stick a, a USB stick in the side of a computer and spread a virus right the way through the, the, the system. So that was an embarrassing day for the head of IT at that particular uh, firm. Um, and um, uh, look, there will be service standards, of course, um, uh, and um, in terms of the, the rollout. Um, and you're absolutely right to say it's not just enough to have connectivity that works on you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It's got to work you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 uh, days a year, um, as far as that is, that is possible. Uh, given downtime for uh, for maintenance and, and other things, but there will, of course, there have to be service standards. Yes, um, Catherine, we're running hugely out of time, <laughs> unfortunately. But would you like to sort of conclude discussions and just say, from an industry perspective, where we go next? 
in, in 30 seconds. <laughs> yes. I, I just want to just make one point on the reliability point, which is that we're never going to be able to stop the JCBs. You know, we, m most of the network in the Heathrow area was taken out about a month ago because of a very enthusiastic builder with a JCB, so that will always happen. The one really good thing about FTTP technology, though, is it's ultra-reliable. So it faults less, it doesn't interact with the British weather, as you can see outside, unlike <laughs> copper. Um, so the thing with rolling out a ubiquitous full fibre network is that you should get that kind of reliability that uh, Nikki's talking about. Um, in terms of just, you know, sort of where we go from here, I mean, I, I think a lot of the points have come out, you know, this only works if we have a single vision and a single destination. I think it is absolutely right that we've set a very ambitious target uh, and then we try and go as hard and fast as possible to get there. It will also only work, as Francis said, I think if um, a lot of us, including uh, probably Nikki um, and colleagues, are looking at this and if we can cooperate because the only way we can get there is this combination of collaboration both within industry because it's a combination of both us as builders but also I see sort of some of the um, sort of ISPs and CPs in the room, so Sky and BT. You know, we've got to sell it, as Nikki says, so we need to work out a plan to sort of upgrade customers and move people across onto the new network. We need to work incredibly closely with local authorities and others to get the access, to get the street works done, and then collaborate very closely with the government to clear the barriers. So mm -hmm. it, it's hugely ambitious, but we are really up for the challenges industry. It will only work, though, if we can clear all of that out of the way. I think, you know, we've made a good start um, at the moment, and I know that Nikki is super committed to trying to help us do that. Mm -hmm. well. Um, thank you. We've had an exceptional panel. I'm sorry to those who couldn't ask questions, but these are questions that aren't going away. I'm sure there'll be opportunities in the future to question people. Um, I'd like you to join me in a round of applause for our panellists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.